Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Raja Adnan Ahmed, and I am a psychiatrist. I work in UK, and with me is Dr. Abdullah Basi, who is uh, a gastroenterologist. He's in the last few months of his training and of gastroenterology, and soon soon will be getting a CCT and becoming a consultant. So this video is part of the interview series which I have done on YouTube, especially for the international medical graduates who have been asking me that you know how to answer NHS job questions. So I've already done about 20 videos on uh, different specific questions, uh, but this one was actually requested from a lot of my MGs because they said, you know, you can tell us how a question is answered, but, you know, we like to see in a mock form that, you know, how somebody does it. So I have invited Dr. Abdullah Basi, who has also helped me in the past and on, on a few videos and his feedback has always been amazing. So what Abdullah will do for the, for this video is that he will act as a candidate and I will act as a consultant. Um, and Abdullah is, as I said, you know, he's he's, he's not a, he's not a junior doctor anymore. He's about to become a consultant. But for the purpose of this video, we I have requested him to act as if he has just done PLAB and he come to UK. So technically speaking, he did his graduation in two thousand and. Uh, 14 and came to UK in 2016. So he will be going back in time and his, his CV is not as strong as what he's got now, but back what he has in 2016 and he will give the answer accordingly. So for the purpose of recording of this video, I would like to say that we are imagining that I am a medical consultant, also I'm a psychiatrist and I'm interviewing a junior clinical fellow for, for a junior clinical fellow post, which is a locally employed or a non-training job in medicine in my hospital. And Abdullah is a candidate who's done, just done PLAB and has uh, just gone one year ex internship and some some more experience on, on his CV. So first we uh, start, and I, I'll ask Abdullah to, so I'd like to thank Abdullah for this. So Abdullah, thank you very much for giving us time and uh, helping the, the new IMGs for, for doing this. Thank you for the opportunity, Adnanvi. And as always, I'm sure IMGs will greatly appreciate your time. I know you have got family commitments as well, but you always take time to make these videos. So all thanks to you, and I'm pleased to be here. So let us, uh, Abdullah, assume that this is 2016, and you've just done PLAB, and you have uh, come, this is your, say, for first NHS job interview. So should we start as a mock? Should we start as a mock and go and get, get into in our roles? Yeah, ready when you are. Okay, so Dr. Abbasi, thank you very much for applying for this job as junior clinical fellow in medicine. My name is Dr. Ahmed, and I am a clinical lead and a consultant in medicine. Um, and I will, I have actually seen your CV as well, and I would like to ask you some questions if you don't mind. Um, so the first question uh, is, Abdullah, for you is, can you please uh, take us through your CV? Um, sure. And, and before I start that, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to interview for this post. Um, so my name is Abdullah Basi. Um, I am a medical graduate from Rawalpindi Medical College in Pakistan. Um, I graduated in 2014 and subsequently I worked in Pakistan for one year. Um, this was equivalent to foundation year one program where I rotated in different medical specialties. Um, and before applying this job and throughout my uh, medical school, um, I have covered various aspects um, that are desirable for your job. Um, I have got some experience in teaching. Um, I have done a clinical audit um, and I had some involvement in clinical research as well. Um, moreover, I'm well versed um, in the core values that you have for this job, including team working. Um, and um, since my graduation till now, I've spent time taking exams, um, and now I've got complete GMC registration, and um, hopefully um, we'll have the opportunity to join your team. So as you know that this is a junior clinical fellow in medicine, um, why are you applying for this job, for this particular job? Um, I think um, there are, um, clinical aspects first of all as i mentioned that um the the only experience that i have got so far is foundation year one experience um from my home country um, and this would be a good stepping stone or this will be a good first step for me to get into nhs so that is more of a logistic aspect from clinical aspects i looked at your job description i know that the job involves um uh, quite wide variety of aspects which is doing ward rounds as well as seeing patients 
on acute medical take um and throughout my my foundation year one medicine is something that really intrigued me and i'm really interested to pursue medicine in future as well so therefore i feel that this will be a very good building block where i can do a lot for the team and can be part of the team um and at the same time i can learn a lot from the team as well um and it will be a, a mutual beneficial relation for both of us and um you said it will be a stepping stone for you so where do you see yourself in the next 5 years um it's difficult to say at the moment because i've i've, I've got few possibilities but um i think where i am planning is i would probably like to stay in this job um, and first settle in nhs understand the system understand the process um and and once i have established myself then my aim in future um is to look for um imt or core medical training um and after core medical training if i decide i've got few sub specialties in my mind um so in 5 years time i would like to see myself as a medical trainee in a certain medical sub specialty what that is exactly i am unsure of but certainly i would like to pursue medicine in future um and uh, you know you, you said you have already worked in foundation year one uh, level job which is your internship um So if I ask you what are the skills and strengths that you can bring to your team So I think the biggest skill that I can bring is a uh, team working on collaboration um my strong suit always has been communication and I feel that as part of the team um I can not only be a good person to assist with the ward rounds as well as to the jobs but also i can be a good member of the multidisciplinary team meetings as well um once i've adjusted i'll be willing to present in those multidisciplinary team meetings as well if given an opportunity um and i'm i'm quite happy to have a good communication and explain all this to um patients and their families as well so that is one strength um apart from that I I have got a background um of being an international medical graduate which is which which takes a lot of toll and which is not easy to come and adjust in the system and I I feel that the fact that I've taken decision to move out of my country taken all those exams itself shows um my strength that I'm decisive um so I think I think all these aspects um uh, would would bring great value to the team and of course I'll be learning a lot from the team as well um but I think these are the things that I can bring to the team so you mentioned the word team uh, and i just wanted to ask you what is your understanding of a good team and a good team player you know what are the strengths what are the key attributes that a team player needs to have um so i think the first most important thing be it in any team um is is role definition so what is expected from each team member um and um what is your role and everyone doing their their the jobs properly so that is the first aspect and the next aspect is proper communication and collaborating and working with each other so if you are seeing that one of my colleagues is lagging behind i can maybe help them or if i feel that i am not able to understand few things um i should have enough confidence to ask them for help and you know they can um, they can explain me the system or or whatever need so i think um good communication um i think well defined roles um with a certain hierarchy um and um i think having that that relationship where you're not a burden on anyone but at the same time you're working for common goals a few of the team works and and this is what i've done even during my foundation year training um this is exactly how we would do our surgical ward rounds and medical ward rounds um and and during my surgical training one of our colleagues was not well for a certain amount of time and we sort of divided amongst ourselves because we don't have any extra support we divide amongst ourselves to fill that role um and make sure that our patients were safe um which which is which is a good example of the team working that i'm talking about i feel and i noticed that when you were defining your cv you also mentioned that you have done clinical audit so one of the questions was i already had with me was that what is a clinical audit but i would also like you to tell me about the clinical audit experience you have as well so first if you start with the, your understanding of clinical audit and then we can move on to your uh, your audit so sure. um so for clinical audit what it is for me is um to measure our services or the certain policies that we have against a set standard and then evaluating what are the points that we can improve on and then implementing on those points so that in a very simplified term is what clinical audit for me is 
um the clinical audit that i did um is when i was rotating during my um job for 3 months in um anesthetics department um, what i noticed is that in in post anesthetic or in recovery a lot of people were complaining of nausea and vomiting so i identified that problem and i noticed how we were managing it mm-hmm. and looking at some of the international guidelines um one of the things that has been shown to be effective was ondansetron now that was not something that was used commonly and we would end up using cyclazine but the studies have shown that ondansetron had benefit um, had had more benefit over cyclazine so um i collaborated and got help from a colleague of mine um who was a mentor as well and works in uk um and then um we looked at the cost as well because people have to buy their own medication and the cost was not too much of ondansetron either um and we had certain people who instead of cyclazine um had ondansetron and certain people had cyclazine and we noticed that the people who were having ondansetron had less nausea and vomiting as compared to cyclazine group so we completed that cycle um we presented our results in one of our department's monthly meeting um and then we decided that unless there is a contraindication um ondansetron would be our first go to for post operative nausea and vomiting um and what does what is that you learn from this experience because this 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 seems like it involved a lot of a uh, lot of team work and a lot of uh, other uh, team members as well is there any learning points from them other from what you what you audit showed um i think um several learning points one is not just identifying the problem on the clinical side but how the logistic sides of the audit would work for example um as i mentioned that these drugs are not available in the hospital we have to ask yeah. patient so before we actually went on the prog- uh, project we, we we made sure that the cost benefit analysis is not huge um and the second was uh, the logistic aspects of coordinating with different parts of the department to present and get their buy in as well so i realized that it's not always a clinical issue that you struggle with a lot of time there are administrative and logistics issues that you learn as you go along which was a great learning because this was more of a problem solving cycle for me more than anything else and uh, now we will move to um, a clinical question i'll give you a clinical scenario and ask you how would you manage that so imagine you are working in your department and you are on the ward uh, as a junior doctor and your registrar is off doing clinics and your consultant is not there so you are the only one on the on the floor of the ward a student nurse comes to you and say that she was doing the clinical observation on a patient and she noticed the patient wasn't himself um and he was looking unwell and when she asked the patient if everything was all right the patient is saying that he's getting uh, chest pain how would you approach the situation and uh, what would you do in this scenario okay so um i think um in this scenario of acutely unwell patient i will go with the student nurse and i will observe the patient and i will examine them and i will start initially because this is an acutely unwell patient with an a b c d approach so i'll make sure that their airway is patent um i will look at the saturation listen to their breathing sounds um and i will look at their blood pressure pulse and i will request our nurses um to do some observations as well um so once i have done the a b c d approach and i made sure that the patient is stable and if i find anything for example when they are doing blood pressure if i find that patient is hypotensive if there is no contraindication um i will give them iv fluids um so i will make sure that the first before jumping on a diagnosis i will go through a b c d approach and make sure my patient is safe once that happens um then i will briefly ask the patient about the chest pain um when did it start what is the nature of this pain um and have they had this kind of pain before um and essentially what i'm trying to do by asking this question is ruling out or narrowing my differential um, diagnosis mm-hmm. um once i've done that then any remaining examination that i have not done in my abcd approach i will perform that examination um and then i will do some basic investigation so if i'm thinking that this could be a myocardial infarction um i will immediately make sure that we do an ecg um or we will do some blood tests including troponins um and once i've stabilized the patient or one i've got some sort of plan i will escalate to my seniors as well but similarly if i have 
think that I've got other causes that could explain the chest pain based on what they were admitted in with or what the history with or you know if this could be COPD this could be pulmonary embolism this could be lots of things so based on whatever my narrow differential is um I will do the initial management escalate to my seniors um and then ask to see if they would like me to do anything else oh thank you so next question is again um a situation that you might face on the ward that um how do you deal with conflict? So, for example, if you're working as a team of uh, doctors and you think that you are doing most work and the other doctors who are same grade, grade as you are actually uh, getting less work or they are uh, giving all their work to you and you're ending up with a lot of work, uh, that sort of situation, how would you deal with that? So I think um, this is something that we briefly touched on before as well is to have well-defined rules. So um, conflict resolution for me is based on what the conflict is. If the conflict is, as you mentioned, um, of uh, people not doing their jobs properly, the first thing is um, when we have a morning board round or when we have initial discussion, we can divide our patients and make sure that everybody is looking after their respective patients and doing the jobs. Um, now, that will be the first step. And if I feel that that is still not working, then I will need to see if there are any certain colleagues or what is the reason that jobs are not being done. Maybe I'm being judgmental and maybe the patient that they're seeing are more unwell or maybe they're not comfortable with dealing certain mm -hmm. uh, certain patients. So if, if that's the case, then we can maybe divide the patients, not just the number of the beds, but based on the difficulty that I have. Now, if that still does not solve the problem, um, then I will probably escalate it to my registrar or whoever makes the rota and discuss the problem with them that, you know, I have to stay back or I have to do extra jobs. Um, but as I said, these are all parts of the team working and I will try my best mm -hmm. to make sure that the patients are safe throughout this journey mm -hmm. um, and then sort of try to resolve that conflict. It could be with one person, it could be more than one person. There are always way, ways to escalate that to the consultants, to the guardian of safety, but I will try my utmost um, to see if I can resolve conflict in the very beginning, um, either on my own or with the help of my colleagues by talking to them and trying to get to the bottom of problem. I think you have already touched some of the points which I was going to ask you in the next question. But, you know, imagine you are working in a very busy clinical situation, very busy clinical ward, and you are getting multiple tasks from multiple sources and you're finding this overwhelming and you're finding it stressful as well. How would you deal with that sort of situation? Um, so the, the the two aspects I feel first is dealing with the problem there and then. So if I've got multiple tasks, I need to triage them or I need to prioritize them based on patient preference. So um, uh, I uh, I need to see who is an unwell patient or, you know, clinically who needs my biggest um, sort of input or attention at the time and I will and that's how I will prioritize them so once I have prioritized my task once I've done the task I will see the situation and see if it is just that everybody was busy on that day um, and it was just a busy day or busy couple of days and we are struggling with the jobs mm -hmm. or there is something more going on for example if we are a big ward and we don't have enough number of junior doctors um, in which case I will certainly escalate to our consultants, um, I will, I can, you know, discuss in the junior doctor meetings and, and there are various forums where we can talk about it. But um, for now, I will make sure that I prioritize them clinically, um, see the unwell patients and, and, and everybody can have a busy day at work. So if it's a one off day work, um, I, will, I will try to do complete as many jobs as I can and make sure all patients are safe. Um, and the next question is about your consultant. So, for example, if you are assisting your consultant in a ward round and your consultant has given a plan for the patient and it's a very senior consultant and uh, given the history or uh, the patient's presentation, they're given you a plan. But you notice that there is something not right about the plan and you think that this is not the right way forward. In fact, if we follow the consultant's plan, it might uh, have worse outcome for the patient. How would you how would you deal with that? Um, so this is one of the good things about working in it, just from what I hear from my colleagues and friends, is that um, 
the, all the aspects rather than a huge hierarchy manner are done um with with patient it being center of care so if i feel um that i don't agree with the plan um then i will discuss with my consultant um in a very nice gentle confidential manner before acting on the plan to see what is the rational um of doing that um because if there are a senior consultant it's quite possible that they have certain reasoning that we did not get a chance to discuss in detail during the ward round um and they felt that you know doing that procedure or doing their test would benefit the patient more um however if i feel that once i have discussed it with them and they did not have any reasons or um when when they have explained it to me i feel that it's not good enough um then i can always discuss with other people because i would never act something that i feel would harm the patient um i can i can discuss with a clinical con- clinical director or you know i can discuss with um, other colleagues as well because um this would be quite a bit escalation ch- challenging a senior consultant in any setup so i i will make sure that i've got all the information mm-hmm. and i'm on the right track um before doing that but but certainly if i feel that it is not in patient's best interest i would not do it okay thank you uh you also mentioned in your cv that you can teach as well and you have got some teaching experience um if you don't <laughs> mind running me through some of the teaching you have done some of the teaching experience you have and you know what have you learned from that um so my teaching experience are two folds um when i was doing foundation year uh, training um i did teaching on the bedside for medical students um but at the same time because i knew that i was planning to come to uk um i did a, a clinical tutor job um for um teaching pathology for few months um for which i've got some formal feedback as well it was always well received um what i have learned is that teaching is not easy <laughs> um uh, but i've learned that um once you start doing teaching you start seeing things in a completely different manner um because you start questioning everything because you feel that when you teach people would question that so you have to prepare in quite a bit of depth um it is a wonderful experience to have and it's it's something that is for mutual learning so you learn as well as um your colleagues that you are teaching learn as well um so i i really enjoyed my teaching experience uh so far you have explained a lot of your strengths uh, and i can see from your cv that you have uh, for your level you have got very good experience as well what are your weaknesses have you noticed any weaknesses or have you ever been given any feedback about any of any of your weaknesses um yes certainly um i think um i i'm i'm quite a motivated and driven person um but sometimes i have been told that if i'm doing something and i'm feeling or i'm facing some hurdles um sometimes i would have an element of frustration if things are not moving at the pace that i would like them to or you know not moving as quickly as they would like to um this is something that i have been told before especially if there is a delay in patient investigations and you know patients are waiting for those things so so i have been told this before and this is something that i'm i'm working on um because i think a lot of that is if there is a delay in getting those things done that could be a system problem and you know apart from chasing them not much that you can do um but certainly this is something that i've told before and and i'm i'm working on this as well um to control those frustrations and and take things at a nice gentle pace um so we have talked a lot about your clinical experience and uh, your skills how what about your hobbies you know what do you like to do outside work and is there anything interesting that you uh, enjoy um so i enjoy cricket quite a lot um i play cricket and i i watch cricket um quite a bit as well and um i'm hoping that um once i move to uk i can continue doing this hobby as well um the other thing that i enjoy is is walking and i know that closer to your hospitals when when i was applying for job i had a look there are lots of very nice walking tracks um so i'm i i hope that in next british summer i'll be able to enjoy all those walking tracks and play some cricket as well okay thank you is there any questions from from your side from uh, for us for us um, so that's the I, end of the question end of the interview from my side 
Um, I just had one question, if that's okay. Um, in in your job description, um, you have mentioned quite a few things, but um, as a clinical fellow, what are the learning opportunities that are available to us? Do we have any formal teaching? Do we have any study budget? What are the opportunities that are available for a clinical fellow who's in non-training in 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 your job? So, although you will be, uh, as you said, a locally employed doctor, sometimes they use the term non-training, but we always treat our non-training doctors as uh, as well as our training doctors. So, you will have money for the study budget as well, and also uh, study leave, access to study leave. You will have access to our local teaching programs, which are going on. But if you want to attend some courses outside, that is something that you can ap apply for as well and apply for approval. Um, then we are... Uh, attached with the local medical uh, college as well so the medical students come there so if you like to teach and continue doing that you can uh, can can work on that then there will also be some research opportunities as well some of our consultants are very actively involved in research i mean this is something you will have to come and and experience and sort of talk to them about uh, ab about that if you are in um, interested in any particular type of research, they can actually certainly uh, help you in in uh, involve you or uh, give guide you at least. So these these opportunities will be available to you if you are offered the job, um, and then you hopefully will be able to th th thrive from that. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the end of the interview. Uh, so Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> this is very good actually. I think uh, you <clears throat> were you actually. I was going to ask you, were you actually, in your mind, obviously you were in 2016, but you think you would have done that well in 2016 because this not, was a very well-formed uh, answer and interview? Not at all. I think I probably, because all, I, like there was no lie, all the yeah. teaching things that I mentioned in audit, this is what I actually done. But I think um, the things that I missed was um, I used a lot of, very specific none that I know about now, junior doctor's forum, triage, um, you know, trust policy, trust values. Um, so I, I would not have done all those things. I probably would have still explained my audit and what we did. Um, but um, a lot of spontaneous questions that you ask, I think people struggle the most when you ask them, so what what are the strengths in a teamwork? Because then that involves a, sort of a high level of cognition and understanding the system. Um yeah. So I, I would not have done even 10% of this at the time, I think. I think this is the this is the issue I, I was going to say, because I, I could see that, you know, when I was interviewing you as a mock. By the way, I just wanted to tell my audience that I actually, he, Abdullah didn't know a lot of these questions. I just said to him that it will be a normal interview, which would you expect? So he, he was being spontaneous and <laughs> acting as he was in 2016. Uh, but I, I, I would say I could see the way you were answering. And this is where the IMG struggle, you know, because they have done all of these things. And but it's about putting them into words, putting them in a way that it will come across as uh, as well as you did. You know, that is where, where we lack. And this is where we, uh, we we fall behind. And as you said, after you have come to UK, after if you work for a year or two years, you start to pick up that language which people use in different situations in the in, in, a, in a lot of uh, things like for example when you were answering uh, the the question around the clinical uh, side of thing i i gave you a junior nurse which uh, a student nurse which would herself won't know much about what's going on with the patient but i like your confidence the way you actually went and assessed the patient you could have started by saying that actually this is you know i don't know what to do i i'm gonna first thing i'm gonna go for is call for help i'm gonna call for my registrar i'm gonna call the consultant on call i'm gonna go run to the next ward and get grab somebody to come and help me so it, it can't be that I'm on my own, but you actually uh, dealt with the situation well that you will actually go and see the patient first and assess, gather information, do the ABCD, and then then escalate. I think that is something, those are the skills you kind of uh, pick up and learn once you start working in the UK. No, but I also feel that you, you're absolutely right. I think as far as, because as far as the language is concerned and choosing the right words is concerned, you, you, that improves the time. But... Um, I, I was, as I mentioned to you before, was involved in some of taking some interviews for registrars and some other jobs recently. And I felt that people are now coming with much more experience than what I had. And they have got much more knowledge than what I had um, when I, I sort of started working in NHS. But I think what the key points that I had was that, that I would give, apart from language, um, would be, um, as you might have noticed, none of my answer, or at least that's what I was trying, was more than one minute. Um, 
like the maximum answer would have been one minute, one and a half minute. This was not you asking me one question. So when you ask me, take me through your CV, I did not give you four minutes answer telling you each and everything about myself. I just left more like a heading. So this is, if I'm writing a paragraph, this is more like headings. I graduated this. I did a foundation year job. Um, I did some teaching. I did some audit. I did some research. I, I left some headings for you to then explore and ask me what you wanted because there were some interviews recently where we asked them take us through this CV and they kept on talking for more than four and a half minutes and maybe answered some of the things that we were going to ask them but did not answer a lot of things so it has to be a conversation between you and me um, because if you ask me I will leave some headings and then um, leave some appetite for them to ask so I think I think small brief answers and and for for example, the question of take us through your CV, it's a very um, very clear question, right? Everyone is going to ask this question. So I would and and since when I started UK afterwards for my interviews, I did have some points in my mind, and I sat in front of the mirror and I practiced these answers. You you you, you can't you can't go without it. So you you know that these mm -hmm. questions are coming. So you practice them and make your answer. I feel one one and a half minute, and then answer. Um and. Coming back to your clinical scenario, I feel that whenever you are being interviewed for a registrar or a junior clinical fellow or an SHO level job, their expectation is that you're not going to jump on asking for help right in the beginning. Their expectation is that as a clinical person, you are going to first make sure that the patient is safe. Because as I mentioned in that scenario, I did not know what was wrong with the patient. And you don't need to always know what is wrong with the patient as in what is the exact diagnosis, but you can examine the patient, you can assess them, you can relieve their symptoms, you can stabilize them, and then ask for help. Sometimes patients is admitted for a few days and we don't know the diagnosis, but you can always manage their symptoms by doing A, B, C, D, you can stabilize them and then ask for help. I think this is, what I, this is an important thing to mention because when they are giving you clinical scenarios um, in, the, in the interview setting, they will always make a scenario like that, that where where you would actually need to go and assess the patient first. Because if if they if they gave you a completely collapsed patient, that for that you have to call the research team, because that's the end of the the, the question. Then you know, the, I'll just call the research team and then they'll come and take over. So they they, they don't want to do that. They want you. They want to see that you know how will you approach the patient, how will you stabilize them, how will how will you try to identify issues, and then you will call call. Uh, call for help and escalate but this is also important to say that you will escalate as well because That's if true. you you can come across as <clears throat> i'm not saying you did but some people can come across as uh, overly arrogant overly confident that you know they will say that there's, there's no need for me to have any help i can manage this on my own and i'll do this i'll do that and they will actually take the patient to cath lab as well without asking anybody so that is something we have to be aware of that as well and, and, and more than arrogance this also comes with some people's background you know yeah. i i once interviewed somebody um, who said, look, this patient was collapsed. Um, we would stabilize them. Um, and once they're stable, I will put an ET tube and put them on a ventilator. Now, that that is a difficult, or we, that, that's usually only done by specific specialist colleagues in the UK. But in other parts of the world, that is not an uncommon practice. As a medical doctor, people would have done that. And I have seen people, you know, do that as well. But you also then have to understand that what is your job description, what is expected of you, but at the same time, what is limited and, and what are the limitations. And I would highly, highly encourage people that if you're giving an interview um, for a job, and I think even before interview as well when you're applying, but certainly if you get an interview, read the job description. Every um, job has a job description which has got the things that they need as a mandatory and the things that are desirable. And then you keep on reference it back to them that, oh, you know, I read your um, job description and these were desirable things. This is how I, this is what I have. And sometimes you say those things without actually saying them. So, for example, if the desirable things is teaching, you don't say, oh, I've got teaching because it's desirable. You keep on explaining your teaching things if asked and then say, and I can clearly see that this is one of requirements or desirable requirement for you as well. So subtly mention it to them so that they know that you have read all those things, mm -hmm. but rather than keep on talking about that, you talk about your own experience. 
I think your answers about conflict resolution and uh, prioritization of the job and too much work is coming towards you, they were also very nice. And I also particularly like, you know, one of the questions I ask at the end, I wanted to see, because I didn't tell you in advance that I'll ask you this, but that do you have any questions for us? So there is a there, there are different ways of answering that, but people can actually uh, end up messing up here as well. <clears throat> because I've seen people, when you ask them, you know, do you have any questions for us? They'll ask, start asking questions which have already been answered in the job description. Things like, you know, how many on calls I'm going to have, you know, where is this ward, this this hospital base, and and how many beds you have on your ward, the, or what would be my salary? Would you count this? So you they haven't offered you the job yet, so salary negotiation hasn't really started at at that point. But the way you you the way you answered uh, was very nice. That you were actually trying to show them that you enthusiasm that you know you're just not after the job there, you want to know that how would this improve you your skill set as well. So you specifically ask about the opportunities uh, to study and to use that, uh, you, you know, uh, have access to some of the things which are available around. Um, just a couple of things I would I mention about this answer as well, but just so one thing about conflict resolution is that um, of course, when people are not here, they don't know how you resolve a conflict, mm -hmm. right? So they'll read a lot of things online, like, you know, escalating into BMA or escalating into consultant and all those things. All those things are well and good, and you should do it. But for any conflict resolution, be it at workplace or at home, the first thing always is try to resolve it gently and nicely at a local level. Okay. Yeah. So when somebody asks you about any conflict resolution, or, or if somebody who has come in and they're inappropriate or whatever, you talk to that person first and try to get to the bottom of that problem to identify that problem. For example, when you ask for conflict resolution or if people are putting burden on me, it's quite possible that there were some foundation year doctors who started new and, and you know, they were struggling with basic jobs that I could mm -hmm. do. So you try to explore a bit more before um, before escalating. And, and what this impression gives to your consultants, it gives them more confidence that this person is not just a troublemaker, they're here to be part of the team. So that is one thing about conflict resolution. About your answer, I 100% agree with you, um, that a lot of those things, and you need to understand what a consultant can give an answer and what medical staffing can give an answer. In all honesty, if you ask a consultant, Consultant, what is my pay and what is my um, rota like? A lot of consultants won't even know because they don't make the rota. It's the medical staffing's job to make the rota and tell you the pay on those things. And those things come later. So you can either ask about the opportunities that you have, but if they have already mentioned those opportunities during the interview, or if they mention how how good the job is, then then you don't ask the same thing again just for the sake of it. You can ask something more on a personal ground. So you can say, look, I'm moving there with my family. Um, I've looked at the hospital. But how is the area to live in? Is it an expensive area to live in? Um, how would I do you think would, would settle my family? Because this will give them the impression that you're really committed to the hospital, committed to the place, and you really want to come and live there and, and would be invested in community as well as the place. So more of a personal questions about how you would settle in, more of a diversity questions and more questions about your academic growth are always helpful rather than asking what my pay is or what my rota is like. Yeah, I think that's that's right. You know, that as you as you mentioned, that's something that shows you enthusiasm about picking up that job and, and exploring the learning opportunities. That is something. But if you don't know what to ask, you know, there's another answer which I have uh, been given myself in the interviews that you can say, uh, that all my questions were answered in the pre-interview research I've done for the hospital and believe that this is a suitable job for me and I will be a good fit for your team. And uh, and I will also it would be a good for, fit for me to learn and, ex and, and expand my clinical knowledge and my interpersonal skills from there. So you are also, also telling them, you know, because you're not asking questions here because you have already researched and come to the conclusion that this is the right job <laughs> rather than just leaving it completely open to say, and you are absolutely right. I've seen people asking, you know, when would you issue my CUS, you know, um, or, or technical questions about uh, the start date or the CUS, which, as you said, the consultants themselves will not, will, will, will haven't got a clue and they, they will get a bit baffled saying, oh, this is something that you need to, you need to ask the HR afterwards, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And and I, I remember some when, when I gave my first interview for my yeah. first job as a clinical fellow, um, they asked me if I got any question. I said, I don't have any question. They're like, oh, what if we offer you a job there and then? And I said, if you offer me a job today, I will sign the job today because 
I had done my research. I knew that it was going to be the right hospital for me to start. Um, and in all fairness, I was desperate for the job as well at the time. So I said, if you give me the job today, I have thought about it. I've spoken to my family. I will accept the job today. They're like, fine, just wait for an hour outside. We'll get the paperwork. We'll get the job. And it happens. I, I recently spoke to a few colleagues who got offered the job there and then. So in your mind, be ready for this question as well, that if they say, okay, um, you are going to get a job offer. What are you going to do? If that is your backup job, or if that is something that you are going to accept, but waiting for another interview, then maybe say, yes, definitely. I'm very interested. Um, and I just need to discuss with a few colleagues that I just have a couple of things and I'll definitely come back to you. But if you think that this is your job and this is for you, just be prepared for this question as well, because it is asked. Okay. Thank you very much, Abdullah, um, for your help. Uh, is there anything else you want to mention or do you think we should finish the session? Um, no, thank you very much for the opportunity. The only thing I would say is um, be ready for the technical side of things. A lot of interviews are online. Adnan, I would know that somehow my Zoom was not working and we were going <laughs> to do it on my laptop, but then it did not work. So we had to go on my mobile and do it as a, as a, as a backup. So even from the technical side of things, um, be prepared, make sure you're in a well-lit room, make sure they can see you, make sure your internet connection is good, um, and make sure you come as if you would come for your normal interview, you know, make sure um, you wear a nice suit or tie or, or be go as if you're going for a face-to-face -face interview. Um, I have had some patient, people who were giving an interview from the bedroom and you can clearly see in the background, so, uh, or they were not in a well-lit room, so, so that's never good enough. No, um, I think that's absolutely, uh, sorry. No, and I know that's not the most important thing, but I think that is the first impression. So when 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 you turn on that call, the first impression that you see is is this person meant to be here? Do they want to be here? How how dedicated are they? Um. So I, I think keep all those things in mind. I think absolutely. Yeah. I, I would. I was gonna say about technology because you know I always ask people to keep a backup as well. Like Abdullah, for as I said, Abdullah, this actually happened naturally that he was trying to do this from his laptop and the laptop's volume wasn't working. I couldn't hear him, and we said to and he has a phone ready and he said he's he's gonna go come on on the phone. So you have to have a backup, some 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 sort of backup available, and you know about about the test that uh, thing you know with your friends or with your family that is the mic working is the camera working is is the background looking okay i have seen people unfortunately interviewing i've seen a guy interviewing in a car and you know he was not just interviewing in a car but he was i think i don't know he was trying to park the car or move the car in between as well so it, it just gives a you know if that candidate is an absolute gem then obviously the hospital will not have an objection to that but otherwise people will start thinking you know this is is this really and one guy was actually interviewing from, uh, was it a shopping mall or an airport? We couldn't tell, but you could see the background as well. Um, and as you said, people have done this. They have joined interviews from their bedroom, not just from their bedroom, but they're actually lying on on the on the bed with the <laughs> with the bed rest behind. And you think, you know, it just gives gives the other person impression that how serious are you? You know, yeah. so you don't need to have like an excellent background but as soon as as a clean background like myself you know there's just a wall behind me that's fine if you can wear a tie and a formal clothes you know that is better if you can if, if you could if you can wear uh, a coat you know that is that will be more impressive that they, they 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 would then see that this person is actually genuinely interested in, in this job and they are there to answer those questions yeah. and and the last disclaimer is answering all those questions everything that there are absolutely more than one way to do these things yeah. <laughs> This is just our opinion how these things should be done. I mean, they're absolutely, as I said, you don't need to copy these answers and give these answers right away. This is just a general guidance about how these things should go. So you should not pick up the answers, but people should pick up the general principle and people should pick up how these things are done and use their own experiences. Only then it is natural, but there are absolutely, you can disagree with so many of my answers um, or these questions, but just just don't start giving these answers. Just take this as a basic principle and use as a building block. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank and this was a very good experience. Thank you. Thank you.